Now, Rock Talk with Mitch LaFon. We are speaking with guitarist Ricky Bird. The new album is called Sobering Times, and it is on the 33rd anniversary of your journey to sobriety. So I do want to talk about that because there is, you know, the other album, Clean Getaway, and there, there's sort of a thematic, um, well, there's a theme of sobriety going on there. So I want to talk about all that stuff. But talk to me about this new album because I've had a chance to hear it. Mm-hmm. And it is fun. I mean, it's a fun, fun album. It just, it, it rocks. So so talk to me about putting that together. Well, well, first of all, hi, Mitch. Good day. <laughs> yes. As we say in Montreal, bonjour, Ricky. <laughs> um, so this is the second, as you mentioned, this is the second, uh, uh, con- let's call it a concept record. Um, Why do I do these? Okay. So uh, maybe, well, first of all, I, when there's not a pandemic, <laughs> I, I go around the country and I do uh, recovery music groups. And I go to treatment facilities, uh, juvenile detention centers, high schools. Um, I haven't been to a prison yet, but I would like to do that, do the Johnny Cash thing. But, um, and I have a collection of songs. I mean, it started with the Clean Getaway record, yeah? Um, that all deal with addiction, recovery, hope, change for the better, you know, but there's, there's nothing goofy about them. They're like rock and roll tunes. Um, and they, they started, I started putting them together. I mean, if you want to backtrack how this happened in the first place, I'll do it quickly. I was asked maybe, I don't know, 10 years ago to come down to Florida. A friend of mine was doing an outdoor recovery event, nothing, you know, major. It was like in, in Florida, in Miami. They put they built a little stage and, and, you know, I had no recovery songs whatsoever, but it was my friend, Richie Supa, who we write together sometimes. And um, I said, yeah, sounds cool. Um, so I came down. And, so we, we did this thing. I think I played I Love Rock and Roll or something. I don't remember. He, he had one recovery song. Um, and after this, this little show we did, I had people coming over to me going, Wow, man, it's so cool to find out your recovery. Like, uh, you know, I, I, I've always loved your career. I love the bands you've played with. Um, either I'm in recovery or, unfortunately, I lost somebody in recovery. Or it's good to know that there are other people. And a kind of like a light went uh, off over my head, uh, which doesn't happen often. <laughs> and uh, uh, so i got to take advantage of it. And I said, well, that's interesting. Um, because I never really um, I never really talked about it uh Really, uh, I mean, I'm not anonymous about my recovery. I'm, I'm very public about that, but not about the, the, the methods, you know, that's, that's kept uh, under cover of the night. But, but the, uh, the fact that I'm in recovery is, is most people know who I am at this point. So, so I started doing, um, we, we hooked up with this third guy and we started doing these kind of recovery events, uh, mostly in Florida. There was a couple of sp- spread out around the country, I think. And we put together a cool band, you know, I think Liberty DeVito from Billy Joel's band was it at my pal. And I can't remember who Andy Burton that plays with Ian Hunt, who was on keyboards. Um, I can't remember who else was in the band. I mean, it went around, you know, uh, Christine Ullman was singing with me, the beehive queen. And um, we would get the same reaction. People just loved it. It was like, oh, wow, we're doing like this sloppy rock and roll. And people are coming over to us and saying, yeah, man, because, uh, you know, we're not a glum lot. You know, we have fun in recovery. It's going back to what you said about the record being fun. Um, so that's, that was that. There was that piece of that. And then um, what happened was uh, I, I remember I was up here in New York. I can't remember how much time I had, uh, maybe 26 years or something like that. And I was going through those moments. I mean, if you stay in recovery long enough, you're going to have moments where, you know, this, everything hits the fan. You know, you don't pick up, you don't use, but you're just emotionally a little distraught, confused. And I called Richie in Florida. I said, you know, I started telling him, he said, well, why don't you just come down here, stay at the house and let's put pen to paper like we do as songwriters and write about it. So we wrote a song called Broken is a Place, which is the last song on the Clean Getaway record. So I came back to New York. I did a quick um, demo and I and I just put it on the Internet. And I started getting all these messages from people from around the world saying, oh, man, you told my story and you made me cry with that. And you made me think with that. And this, again, same light bulb. Uh, and I said, well, this is interesting. So I wrote a second song. You know, when I had about five or six songs, um, I made a call to one of the uh, that I, I 
met uh, somebody from when we were doing those gigs in Florida. And I said, D I know you have a place up in Jersey and I live in, in New York. What if I came there with an acoustic guitar and I just did like a group, like a recovery music group, you know, come in with my tats and, you know, my rock and roll history and pedigree and let me, let me play for the clients. Yeah, sounds great. So I went in there and I, and I did this first one and it was, I came out of there on a cloud. I mean, I only had like six songs um, and everybody, the same thing. I was getting the same reaction from everybody. Wow, man. It was like, I felt the same way. Like you told my story, like I identified so much with the lyrics. So I kept writing. And the one common ground, that, uh, common uh, thing that kept happening after, after each group is they'd come over to me and they'd say, where can I get this music? And I kept procrastinating and, you know, I think it was like eight months and I said, I guess I got to do a record or something. So I did the Clean Getaway record, you know, and um, we put it out. I mean, who knew like I was going to do this? this? I'd be this guy. But um, the, the main rules were it had a rock and it had to have a message, but no preaching allowed. <laughs> you know, I'm not the I'm not the sobriety police, man. I'm just here to, to, to tell you what it was like and how, you know what it's like now and, and if you want to change reach out there's plenty of help out there. There's twenty five million people in, in America alone that are in recovery. So we put out the clean getaway record and we got such a great response. I said, you know what? Let's let's rinse and repeat. <laughs> so <laughs> right. I started writing songs, you know, um, as I would do, as if just like I'm doing any kind of record. Um, and I started to go into the studio. I, I always work I've done three records at um, a place called uh, Parcheesi Studios in Huntington, Long Island. It's like 45 minutes from me. And my partner in crime there is Bob Stander, who, who owns the studio. It's in his house, man. It's in his basement. You know, analog, digital, um, both. Um, and uh, we started recording, you know. And I, have a, I don't have a band, so I have a cast of characters that have been on the last three records, give or take. Um, and we recorded this, and it took two years. So uh, Clean Getaway came out in 2017, Let's say to getting close to 2018, uh, halfway through that, you know, I started doing this. And um, it took almost two years, not consistently, though, continuously. If I look at the, like the log of my studio time, it was like two months. But because of scheduling, mine and his, it took almost two years. And we, we came in almost under the wire once the lockdown started here. I mean, New York was brutal. It was like it was like Thunderdome. Uh, in March. So, uh, but, so we did a couple of last minute things over the phone, mi uh, you know, mixing, tweaking. Uh, and, and so here we go again, you know, this is the second one and yeah, it's gotta be fun. It's gotta be rock and roll. No preaching allowed. My job is just to lay the, the words out. You know, this is, this is what addiction's all about. You know, uh, no, you're not alone. We all feel the same way at certain times. Um, we've all been there. And if and if you want to change your life, here's some solutions. So like at the end of every song is, you know, there's some form of a solution, uh, you know, and not everything is, is, is uh, you know, hitting a nail with a hammer addiction. There's just stuff on there that like the song Stronger, I Come Back Stronger is about changing your life for the better. Um, I wrote a song on, uh, funny enough, I went to Nam two years ago in Nashville and I, I picked up a, a Mando guitar. I came back to New York and I started strumming Hear My Song, the third song on the record. Yeah, it's got like a McCartney kind of vibe. Um, and I started, you know, uh, I started writing about gratitude. Uh, so that's about gratitude. You know? and, and, and that's it. So I, I love this batch of songs. I co-wrote three songs. And I did a cover of, I actually did two covers, but I only one made it on the record. I did a cover of Merle Haggard's The Bottle Let Me Down, which has been covered a few times by country uh, people, I think. But I did it kind of like, like the faces, you know, which is, my style, I guess, um, or one of my styles. And um, I also did a, a pretty damn good uh, cover of Reach Out, uh, I'll Be There by the Four Tops. But as I was putting together the actual record, there was this commercial for like, it was, I don't know, it was like a, a car insurance or it was something. And it had a god-awful version of that song. And I just went, yeah, I think I'm going to hold on to this one for a while. <laughs> Sounds like a yeah, Geico it, commercial. Yeah, it was just bad. It was like, it sounded like teenagers or something. Uh, and, um, you know, I mean, I played that whole intro, like, like, you know, I Jeff Becked it out, like, a whole bit. So we'll, we'll do it as a bonus track. We'll put it out down the road. But, um, 
you know, it, it's, I'm really proud of the record. I mean, my daughter Francesca, Frankie, she took the photos because it was, we we're in a lockdown, right? So like, a, where was I going to get photos? Um, so we went down, we took, we took a, some of them here in the basement. I think the back cover was here in the basement with my, with my purple backdrop, uh, that I told you before that I, I, I love the purple it. backdrop. It's a, it's a, it's a table cloth that I bought on uh, Amazon because <laughs> I wanted to do some streaming live stuff. <laughs> um, cause I used to have a finished basement, but I lost, uh, you know, we lost everything in Sandy down here. So it's just concrete and, uh, you know, shelving. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. Let, let, let me ask you this. You, you mentioned that you go into the recovery place with like six yeah. songs and an acoustic guitar what was that thrill like for? Because you're going in and you don't know what's going to happen. And then you come out of there and people go, wow, that was fantastic. I connect with you. Because you, you've you played the largest stages with Joan Jett. You've played the stadiums. You've opened up for all these people. I love rock and roll. goes to the top of the charts. You have all of this. But I'm assuming that that little moment with that that guitar was probably the most powerful, right? Yeah, you hit the you hit the uh, nail right on the head. You hit the bird right on the head. Yep. Um, there's something that I'm getting out of this that I didn't go out of. Um, at, let, don't get me wrong. I love my career in, in, in civilian rock and roll. I couldn't ask for a better, a 13 year old kid got to do what he wanted to do. Right. Um, uh, played with most of my heroes growing up. Uh, but there's something extra here because, uh, you know, I'm a recovery guy. Um, and when I love seeing people get it. So now talking to people out here and, and, you know, on Facebook that are in recovery and we private message each other and this and that, that's one thing you go into a treatment center or a detox and people are just coming in and they're just, you know, waking up from a disaster. Uh, and this is like their 10th rehab and you play something and they said, you know, you look over there and you see some big tough guy, like kind of crying a little bit, which I always tell them, uh, uh, I said, man, you know, we used to use to not feel, L look at you, look at the progress you're making and you just got here. Imagine, you know? So yeah, there's, there's something I get, a, I get something out of, of seeing other people get it. It's my responsibility as being somebody in recovery, long-term recovery that I pass it on. There's a lot of people struggling, man. I mean, for whatever reason, insurance, uh, not ready, um, uh, you know, pandemic, Whatever the reason, there's a lot of people that need to be in treatment that can't get into treatment. Yeah. Uh, and and I found a really great third act for myself, where I could still be this you know rock and roll pirate guy, but um, um, my message is about um, you know changing your life for the better. And uh, once again, I'm not the, the sobriety police. Like I'm I'm just there to put the message out there, man. You know I can't get anybody clean. So let me ask you about that. When was your epiphany? Because you talk about the light going on. You know you're on the road. And you're playing these stadiums and everything's going well. And 33 years ago, something goes, okay, that's it. Done. I'm done. <laughs> and and there's got to be a moment where, where you just at the lowest low where you just went, wow, yeah. the, the next is six feet below unless I start looking up, right? Well, I had a couple of near misses. Let's okay. put it that way. Uh, some of them, uh, you know, uh, I mean, not everybody knows about that stuff, like the, what goes on in your hotel rooms or uh, when you're in your house. Um, but I did have a couple of near misses. Uh, so I started, um, first of all, I have, I have this in my family, right? My dad and his father both died, uh, as a direct result of alcoholism. Uh, I have an uncle that's got 40 years in the program. So you could change the dynamic of your family at any time. Um, and funny enough, he used to send me like pamphlets, like recovery pamphlets when in the eighties, when we were sitting around doing blow and, and drinking Jack and stuff. And I would go, what is this? Like, why is this man sending me this stuff? <laughs> So I used to, you know, I used to use it to put my, my glass of Jack on it so I wouldn't ruin the table, you know, uh, or, or, you know, cutting stuff up. But uh, so, uh, so, so I got that. I got the disease, right? I started smoking pot when I was 13. Um, I was a very quiet, shy kid. Um, I loved music and baseball when I was a kid. But I kept to myself, only child kept to myself. Um I hated, you know, fearful going to school. I just, I was, you know, I knew I wanted to be in music when I saw the Stones and the Beatles on Ed Sullivan when I was nine. I, I looked up and I went, that, <laughs> you know, because they yeah. look different than the rest of the world. And I felt different as a little kid, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, uh, and the music, I love the music. I mean, and then when I saw them do Jumping Jack Flash in like, like freaking 
devil knows what when Rob Sullivan show, I went, oh yeah, <laughs> that's for me. Um, so I started smoking when I was 13 and immediately I felt uh, a weight of the world as a little kid, a teen, young teen removed, like when I smoked pot. Now, we all, most of my friends were smoking pot and having a Heineken in a garage band. You know? Not everybody went on to continue the path and keep adding on to it, you know, chemistry. Uh, I did. And, um, you know, when I started hanging out at like 16, 17, I was already hanging out in rock clubs in the city. So now I'm hanging out with all the people. So I'm doing pills. I'm drinking hard liquor along with the beer. And the pot go, runs through the whole story. And I'm not, you know, I wasn't one joint guy, you know, uh, I was like, I was wake up in the morning, you know, the, the little roaches in the ashtray, like somebody that smokes like cigarettes and there's always like little bits and pieces in the ashtray so they could in a pinch, they got something. Um, so yeah, 16, 17, but it was all fun and games, man. There was no consequences. I was just a teenager. So you wind up in somebody's strange person's house, you know, the next morning in like Brooklyn or something, you know. It was all funny games. When you're an adult and you start having responsibilities and you're still acting like that, there's a problem. Then I get into bands and then everything starts to increase a little bit. Now we're in the 80s, late, uh, late 70s, early 80s, and cocaine is introduced. Uh, because when I was a kid, I mean, cocaine was something, you know, I heard like, you know, it was in a song called Minnie the Moocher, you know, from the, from the 30s. Like, you know, she was a real cokey. Like, I didn't know what cocaine was really when I was a kid. Um, you just read about it. You saw it on TV. You know, you heard rich people did it or something. Um, and heroin? In high school, there must have been like, you know, four or five people all the way in the corner in the schoolyard in my school, you know, in leather jackets. Those were the kids that were known. Ooh, they do heroin, right? But we didn't, we didn't, I didn't know about it. The only thing I knew was what I read in rock magazines. This one died from heroin. This one died from, you know. Uh, so early, late 70s, early 80s, cocaine came in. And I was just... Yeah, I'm into this. I like this. And it sucked. It was awful. When did it start it becoming a problem? Because, again, and, and I'll go back to the whole Joan Jett thing, the, the 80s were great for you. I mean, the, yeah, the, 80s, were, the, the 80s were terrific. Yes, they were. When, when does it start going where, you know, Joan or anybody else looks at you and goes, oh, okay, he, that, that's not how you play this song. This is not working. Or the manager goes, um, we don't know if he's going to make the gig because he's – yeah, it was never like that, really. Okay. Uh, as far as, like, I, I could say, honestly, that um, I could count uh, maybe two or three times that um, I did, like, cocaine before a gig, you know? And it's, it was awful. <laughs> it was just awful, because, like, three songs in, you need more. So I was like, uh, this is not for me. You know, and I know the stories, the Aerosmith stories with Steven, like, freebasing behind the amps and stuff. It's like, no, I didn't do that. But, um, uh, and so... For, for gigs, yeah, maybe we smoked a joint or, or you know, you'd have a Heineken or two, but I was never really trash for a gig. It was always after the shows, you know, whether we were tour, when we were driving to the next place um, on the bus or it was in the hotel room partying or people you met from the show or this and that. And then when I came off the road, those in-betweens, it was just party, 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 lots of blow, you know. I mean, just a lot. And com combine that with taking pills. I mean, I was a garbage head, you know, just give me whatever you got. I'm good. Um, I was, uh, you know, physically I was 128 pounds. Um, you know, I played, I still played fine. I was, you know, played rock and roll fine. Um, so I guess to answer your question, there was, that wasn't. So, so you never hit it, a wall, like, you never hit a wall professionally then. There right. were a couple of, no, I don't think so. I mean, a couple okay. of people said to me, dude, you know, I remember once I was with my friend Steve Marriott from Humble Pie, right? And I was well into my uh, cocaine maniac stuff, maniac stuff. And we, I was sitting on his tour bus. He was doing, he was playing in the city with his one of his last bands, right? And, you know, he was crazy. We were hanging out and we were both together. We were insane, double down. Um, but I remember I kept grabbing the coke from him and, and he was notorious for drinking and partying. And he looked at me and he said, you know, mate, you might want to cut down. And my brain just went, oh, that's not a good sign. You know, so, so, uh, yeah. And then there was, there was an interest, there was a, um, an incident in 1983. We were on the road with Joan um, and I collapsed my lung. Um, my lung collapsed. I collapsed my lung or my lung collapsed. Well, I guess I was part of it. Both. We were in, 
Oprah Alabama and, and it collapsed on stage. And, um, you know, I found out later on that I, I was really I had 10 minutes. I was having, I was going to have a massive heart attack. I heard from the doctors. Um, uh, so they, they made up a publicity story that Gary, you know, I couldn't, I was off the road for a couple of weeks. So there's a, there's a moment. Um, and they made up a, a story that Gary, the bass player hit me on stage by accident with his, uh, you know, the head of his bass. He had one of those big Ampeg bass with the looped headstock. So that was nonsense. Uh, I was I was back in New York. I started smoking coke a little bit, and I literally burnt a hole in my lung that it took a little while to manifest. And then it was like a bicycle tire, you know. Between that and not living right and smoking a lot of pot, and just part and not sleeping and stuff. It's just I blew a hole in my lung, um, and that was in '83. And it took me till '87 to to decide I'd had enough, you know. So from '83, uh, you know. Once that incident happened to 87, that's where, like, I started circling the drain, you know, because you want to stop, but you can't stop. And it's like this cycle of, like, disappointment and um, remorse and, you know, this and that. Um, and it's funny because I, I just heard uh, somebody tell me that people from back then were saying, oh, I don't think he had much of a problem. It's like, dude, you should have been in my hotel room at 5 o'clock in the morning or been, been here in New York, you know, what, what, what was going on. No, I had a problem. Let me, yeah, I had a problem. Let me ask you about this, because I, I once spoke to Dave Mustaine of Megadeth, and he said, once an addict, always an addict. You, you, you're, you're, you're that till the day you die. Do you have that constant struggle every morning where you just go, hey, a little whiskey wouldn't hurt? I mean, is, is there yeah. still that hurt? No? no? I mean, listen, um, I was talking to somebody about this. I mean, I have tools that I've, I've, I've collected over the last 33 years, uh, recovery tools that I use so I don't get to that point. Do I have emotional uh, non-sobriety sometimes? Yeah. When I don't do the work that I was taught, I let outside things affect my men my my serenity. Let's just say, uh, yeah. I, I could honestly say I, I can't think of. I don't know. Maybe early at the beginning, I thought, oh, that'd be great if I could just do. This. I never ever think of. Oh, I wish I could have a drink, or I wish I could have a, a drug. I mean, you know, if I'm kidding around, I'll say, man, I would just love to watch a Yankee game and take a hit off a joint and just relax with no. I can't do it. I'm, I'm an a So what I mean by that, I don't know what Dave meant, is is I um, have a disease that um, once triggered, once you do the first one, it starts this process of craving, uh, of doing stuff that you know is bad in spite of the consequences. Um, now, after 33 years, am I cured? Well, not history. In the history of recovery, the chances are I'm not cured everybody's different. Like maybe I could have a, a glass of Jack Daniels and I'd be fine. Do I want to take that chance? I don't think so. Yeah. So that's the point. We're at that, we're at that thing. It's like, I'm fine. You know, as far as me being an addict an addicts an addict, what that means is like, if I do the first one, the odds are the over and under is that I'm going to start go, you know, wind up. The, yeah. Where, the plunge. You're going to take the plunge. Well, I'm going to wind up where I started ended, but, but you know, I, I know like I, from the history of recovery, you see some people, they have years, like, and they say, you know what, I'm just going to, I like a glass of wine at the end of the day. And it may take five years until they wind up back in that hole again. And it happens either slowly, very, everybody's different. The, the thing I know is like, I'm better off like this. I had a couple of near death experiences. I was a, a, a complete maniac. And, you know, now uh, in, in, in this over three decades, I've made 101 uh, mistakes in recovery. Uh, none of them were picking up a drink or a drug, but I've made stupid moves. Uh, I've heard people, um, you know, uh, we're all human. We, we do dumb, dumb ass shit from time to time. But yeah, I, I can I can attest to that. And, and I know somebody who's who's in recovery and he went in for all the hard drugs. And after three years, he started drinking again. And I said, uh, dude not going to work. He goes, yeah, but I went in for the drugs. I didn't go in for the alcohol. I'll be fine. I'm like, mm. yeah, I'm not well, too sure about that. Yeah. I was like, I'm not too sure about that, bro. <laughs> well, that's an interesting thing because it's not up for me to tell people that it's, I could suggest it. The, the point is, is that um, this is a disease that is, has a, a couple of different parts. It's physical, mental, spiritual, you know? So, so like we drink to not feel, or we use to not feel, you know, the, I like getting high is, is old you know it's really if you get to the start peeling away the onion it's because you, you you're hiding something you're 
you're trying to avoid life and life's terms, whatever the hell it is, Tra trauma from when you were a kid, whatever it was. So if you're abstinent, um, first of all, you can't get high if you don't drink or drug. That's a fact, right? If you, um, and I learned this when I went to school a couple of years ago to get certified as a counselor, uh, I'm a counselor in training. Um, if I ever get back to work, it'll be great. Um, and a recovery coach. And I learned, um, like, like uh, with recovery coach, it's almost like you're in recovery when you say you are. The, the, the thing is, so like, it's harm reduction. So, well, I'm not doing heroin, heroin anymore, but I still like to drink, like you just said, right? Um, and you have to, as a recovery coach, it's like, okay, so let's work that way. Now, if that doesn't work out for you, then we can move to square two. Point being is, once you start using, you're once again in that realm where you're not living life as it's handed to you, and you're masking your feelings and stuff. So you're back to that again, you know. So, so to my only, my humble opinion, you know, abstinence, total abstinence. Eventually, I mean, I could, I could understand harm reduction until you get to a point where you find total recovery, where you just don't do anything. Um, that's the way I done it and it, and it, and it works for me, whatever, listen, bro, whatever keeps you on the right side of the grass, I'm all for it. That's, that's yeah. the way I look at it. And, and, and I'm not speaking about myself. I've been lucky enough that I ha I don't drink. I, <laughs> so I ha I've had two heart surgeries in my life and a drink would, would not work out for me. So I just, you know, I'm, I'm off of that. Oh, we, we're at half an hour. I just want to ask you one uh, Joan Jack question before we leave. Uh, a lot of her great singles, uh, I Hate Myself for Loving You, uh, Crimson and Clover, I Love Rock and Roll, all outside songwriters, Alan Merrill, uh, Desmond who Child, etc. Who we just lost, Alan, in the COVID virus. Yeah, That's he was one of the first, unfortunately. He's a friend of mine, too. Yeah, well, we share him as, as a friend in common because we used to email each other, Alley Cat, Alley Cat. Yeah, yeah. And We've done I Love Rock and Roll together in some clubs in the city. It was, it was great fun. Yeah, absolutely. But let me just qu quickly ask about that. In terms of a lot of the great singles, a lot of the great success had these outside songwriters. W was that something that was needed or was it a frustration that the songs the band were writing weren't the ones that were getting the radio attention? Was it was it the record company saying, hey, go write with Desmond? Hey, go. How did that sort of come together? Uh, I mean, oh, God, who knows? But, uh, you know, Sinatra didn't write anything. No, I, I, and by the way, yeah, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not holding it against you. No, but I'm saying like some of it might have been record company. I mean, I remember, you know, I, I love reading about people like Sinatra and stuff. There were times in the '60s when his career was like not going anywhere. They would say, "Hey, you should cut this song, Winchester Cathedral," you know, and it was like, "I don't think that's good. no, just cut it." You know, I don't know if he had a hit or, but you know, record companies will come to you and say. We got this writer, Desmond Child. He's written like a song for Bon Jovi. He's written a song for this one for Alice Cooper. You know. And they came up with Hate Myself for Loving You, and it was great. So I think it really doesn't matter. I mean, mm -hmm. I co-wrote like 13 songs with Joan um, uh, for the, for the uh, Blackhearts and Kenny. And um, I don't know. I guess it doesn't really matter where it comes from uh, to me. I, I don't know. I mean, why does somebody put a cover song on? Like, I, The Bottle Let Me Down is a great Merle Haggard song. Now, now Merle Haggard did it country, you know. You know, well, each night I leave the ballroom. I did it. You know, they're great songs. You know, why not? If somebody writes a great song and you, you cover it, you know, what the, what's the difference? And Crimson and Clover, great idea, great thought. You know, I don't know where it came from. Great idea for a girl to sing it. Uh, and um, uh, what else? I mean, we did, people keep posting stuff that I forgot we did. Uh, I know we did a covers record somewhere in there, but we did Bird Dog. We did... Uh, we did Star Star by the Stones. We There's a whole bunch of songs that we did. Yeah, um, you did some covers. Chuck Berry stuff, too. Yeah, I mean, I don't remember. It was like 35 years ago already. But it, it, great uh, great stuff. And and listen, it, you, you have the ultimate compliment in the sense that I love rock and roll. Your version is the version that people know and recognize. Kind of like Twist and Shout by the Beatles. People go, oh, I love Twist yeah. and Shout. Yeah, that's a cover song. And, they go, oh. <laughs> the, right? And Aaron, Aaron did a great, uh, his band, The Arrows, did the Arrows. a great job on it too. Listen, um, I've had a great, um, I've had a great career so far. It's certainly not over yet. Um, but um, being with Joan and the Blackhearts led to a lot of cool stuff. I love Joan. Um, I love playing that stuff with her and tour in the world. You know, and I'm in the rock hall because of Joan um, and that that particular, the four of us. Um, and... Um, from there, now I'm doing this stuff. And, and also because, you know, one thing we didn't mention is like, 
because of my history and stuff from playing with Roger and Ian and this one and that, I get to be in these all every time there's like a big charity event, you know, I'm part of these like, um, uh, like all-star bands with like live on drums and maybe Willie on bass and Paul Schaefer, you know, and I've backed up Smokey Robinson, Mavis Staples, Sam Moore. Like, I mean, dude, the list is ridiculous. Like I've had, I've been able to play songs that I listened to when I was like 12, you know, with the real guys, you know? So I have nothing to complain about. And now I'm at this stage that I just want to play rock and roll. I mean, this might be, I don't know. I don't think I'm going to do another recovery record, but uh, uh, who knows if I'll do another album, maybe singles, but I'm very happy. This third act, I couldn't ask for better. I've combined rock and roll with um, trying to help people uh, because I've seen it from both sides. I've seen it as a counselor. I've seen it as a friend that knows people, you know, lots of people that have passed over the years. I know it. And, and as a user, who's in recovery. And I know you don't have to live like that anymore. So I'm just trying to do it with like three chords and a smile and, and a skull ring. You know what I mean? Just to... Well, it's working out. I mean, Sobering Times is, is a fun, fun album and it's out September 25th. And uh, as, as always, as we say in Montreal, merci, uh, Ricky. Absolute pleasure. It's been like 20 years between our interviews, but uh, I always look forward to it. So thank you. Uh, I hope it's not going to be another 20, baby, because I'll be in a home by then. Yeah. And, and yeah, who knows where I'll be. So no, hopefully the next one will be like next year on when, when we get back to a full touring and full, you know, let's go. Just, just let people know that they could um, pre-order the record at rickybird.com. Very simple. Rickybird.com. Bird is with a Y. And, and uh, it comes out September 25th uh, to, uh, with my anniversary and um we're working on it we're just finishing up a distribution deal so I'll, it'll be on all the usual suspects a- apple and, and stuff and spotify and all that stuff and and okay. if you pre-order um you know on rickybird.com like my life right now is doing interviews and then tonight i sit there while i watch the yankee game and i'm signing cds <laughs> and putting packages together and then i go to the uh, post office and they see me come with a giant bag and they go oh no not him again <laughs> <laughs> that's the way that's the way to do it and and oh, i love the so fact weird. that you have a physical product because you know I've got, I've got my i've got my ufo collection over here I, I i i need physical i can't do this uh i wanted to do vinyl yeah um but um i you know we started the pre-orders a while ago and i out of hundreds and hundreds of pre-orders i only got literally a handful of people that wanted vinyl and and i was looking at the expense of of, of manufacturing and i and so i wrote people and i said here's the deal uh, I'm not going to do vinyl right now because there's not enough of you want it. But in lieu of vinyl, I'm going to give you a thank you on the back of the cover <laughs> on nice. the inside. And everybody went, okay, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, a lot has been said about vinyl versus CD. But a, a, a CD you can produce for like 90 cents. <clears throat> but a vinyl is, is like 30 bucks. And it's just like, okay. I mean, well, maybe it'll come down because now they're saying that, uh, what did I just read that? Vinyl, vinyl has outsold CDs for the first time since uh, the 1980s. So maybe that means you know, if more people do it, the price will come down. I mean, I'm just starting this record. I could I could do a vinyl in six months and add a bonus track or something. I just couldn't do it right off the bat because this is all D U D I D D Y I. Do it yourself. Do it yourself. D Y I. Right. Um, and, no, do uh, D I Y. Sorry, D I Y. Yeah, D I Y. Yes, D I Y. <laughs> uh, so you know, we're just doing we're doing the best I can, best we can, and um, I'm just doing I'm I'm just like in between interviews and packing up the stuff um, i haven't touched my guitar in two weeks which is really weird yeah. you know well, i started a song two song uh, two two weeks ago and then i put it down and i like thank god i put it on my phone like i sort of sing into my mic on the phone otherwise i would not remember anything yeah so 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 pick up the guitar give uh, give liberty a call and let's get some more music uh, done yeah. got, got plenty of pandemic free time to do this stuff so uh, yeah. sobering times baby absolutely sobering times thank you sir merci Nice talking to you, Mitch. Absolutely. You. you too. Cheers. All right, good.